episode 29. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we discuss running a great practice so you can quit worrying about paying the bills and focus instead on creating great architecture and leaving a lasting Hello, legacy. Hello, Agile Architects, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture. This is Enoch, and today we're joined by Bernie Sybin. He's a consultant who has 35 years of experience in the AEC strategic planning industry and marketing. And so what he does is he helps firms develop strategic plans, manage statement of qualifications, proposals, presentations, etc. And what I find is going to be really interesting about this conversation is that he helps architecture firms work with government clients and public sector work. So Bernie, welcome to the show and I look forward to hearing more about you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Always, always enjoy the opportunity to share what I've learned. Awesome. Well, first of all, I noticed on your bio that you have a background as a cabaret performer. And so before <laughs> we jump into the business side, let's talk about that. Tell me a little bit about, let's just get fun for a second and personal. Tell me about your cabaret experience and what that's all about. I had my first professional experience in Austin, Texas in January of 1975. So... My cabaret career actually is old, is older than my AE marketing career, um, and pretty much uh, there have been times where that's all I did for a living was work five or six nights a week in places. I've worked a number of clubs in Dallas and Austin, uh, Fort Worth, Houston, West Palm Beach, uh, Chicago, and done a lot of theater along the way as well. Uh, worked some clubs in Visalia, as a matter of fact. Um, there's a, a great coffee company on Main Street about a block from Bank of America, or there was when I lived there a couple of years ago, and they had live entertainment, and I worked there, and I did shows for uh, Icebox Theater. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been interesting. It's something I like to do very much, and I wish I had more more of it going on right now, actually. Interesting. Well, you know, and I just want to mention, Bernie mentioned Visalia because that's where I'm based out of here in California. And this is great because we have so much business on here sometimes, Bernie. It gets a little dry, a little boring. So tell me mm -hmm. what is cabaret for people who aren't familiar with it? Well, um, if, if you think of, of, night, of typical nightclub performances or um, uh, lounge performances or whatever, and then make it as theatrical as, as you possibly can. Uh, if you're standing at a microphone singing into the dark, it's lovely, but it's not cabaret. You have to be in communication with your audience. Uh, generally, the material is more theatrical than other kinds of club venues, and the delivery is more theatrical. Um, and it it's not the... If, if you're doing really good cabaret, then the audience is not sitting there talking and you're not background music. You are the reason they showed up. Nice, nice. Whereas with a lot of nightclub stuff, it's just going on in the background while people talk to their friends. Gotcha. In gotcha. a real cabaret, the owners will come by and ask you to be quiet. Wow. You know, I'm hearing a little bit of echo on my voice. Could you turn your sound down just a little bit, Bernie, so we can adjust that and get rid of that echo? Okay. All right, I've taken it down about 15%, okay. it looks like. Oh. Is that better? Testing, testing. Now, I'm still hearing some echo a little bit. See if you can take it down a little more and still hear it. It's going to be a fine line. I can still hear you with no problems. Is is the Are you hearing an echo on what I say or on what you say? On what I say. You know what, it went away now, so I think we're good. Okay, fine. Appreciate it. Awesome. Uh -huh, no problem. So that's interesting. So you've done that in addition, and then you've also, uh, you also have a background in the AEC industry. So tell me a little bit right. about how you got involved in the AEC market. I went to my first firm in 1978 here in Austin as a statistical typist on a Selectric, on an IBM Selectric typewriter, and I typed tables all day long for an environmental firm. So they were species occurrence and all kinds of stuff like that. And half of the work was in Latin because of the scientific names. 
and I went from that to being a word processor to being a word processing manager. And when I and, and then I transferred to another one of their offices in a marketing role and stayed in a marketing role um, from coordinator to manager to corporate director to my own firm. Fascinating. And that, your firm, was it a consulting firm where you consult with others or was it an actual AEC firm? No. It, it, well, the, anytime I've been employed by another firm, it's been an AEC firm. Um, my first one was a huge environmental firm, a dozen office, 900 staff, um, bugs and bunnies, environmental kind of thing, permitting and compliance. And from there, I went to Carter and Burgess, which is now part of Jacobs Engineering. From there, I went to a small minority-owned, woman-owned 8A firm in Dallas and, uh, and, and spent time there. And then I went to a white bread firm uh, in California that did everything. Uh, architecture, planning, surveying, construction management, everything but actual construction. And then I came back to my own firm. And in my own firm, I'm a consultant to any of these other firms. Okay, excellent. Well, before yeah. we jump into the meat of the interview, tell me, uh, give me one one of your favorite business books or a book that you want to share that I think the audience should check out. One of my one of my real favorite books that the that the market's going to know about is a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. This is about how good companies became great companies and stayed that way. And he uses uh, a lot of examples, and he's really good about giving you the data on what they did and why they were selected for the things they were selected, and also on what the competition either did or neglected to do that prevented them from getting onto the great firms list. And I, I very much like his attitude, uh, two things, as a matter of fact, two attitudes. One is that it's not enough to get the right people on the bus. You have to get the right people into the right seats. So you have to have the right staff, and each one has to be doing the right thing for their skills and talents and interests and what have you. And the other thing I really like about this, and I think every firm needs to know this, is that you have to figure out what you can do better than anybody else and make that your number one assignment, your number one goal. There are a lot of architectural firms out there and a lot of AE firms out there, and it's hard to be the best, particularly if you're a small firm competing against 50,000 person firms like URS. But the fact is that you might be better at uh, client service than some other firm, or you might be better at uh, architectural rendering than other firms, or whatever it is that you can be better at than than anybody else, and that's the thing on which you hang your hook. You awesome. know, that's that that's the thing that you do is the thing that no one else does as well, and that's your entry to all your markets. Great. So you gave us the book by by Jim Collins from Good to Great, and I just want to take this moment to tell the listeners that if they'd like to get this book in an audio format that they can listen to while they exercise or while they drive. They can go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash book and get a free audio book. So if you want to read this book or hear it, if you haven't heard it yet, you've got to get Good to Great. It's a very excellent book, and you can get that at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash book. So now that this shameless promotion is done, we can move on. Well, actually, that's that's Jim Collins' shameless promotion. The real shameless promotion would be if I told you about my book, which is about marketing AE services to public sector firms and, and the laws that establish the process and, and how it works at the federal, state, and, and municipal levels and sometimes how it doesn't work. Um, but that book is called A Horse of a Different Color, Marketing in the Public Sector. And I think at the moment the only place you're going to find it is the SMPS Bookstore and PSMJ.com. Uh, I don't think it's actually, I don't think it's even available from Amazon at this moment. So anyway, so there's so there's that, and that's my shameless promotion for the day. Excellent. Well, we're gonna leave we're gonna leave a little open. Um, we're gonna come back to that in our in our interview that we're gonna air next week because we're gonna talk in that interview a little bit about how to do business with these public sector clients and how to chase that kind of work. So I'll, I'll hope everyone tunes in for that conversation. It's gonna be really good. Now. Bert, you mentioned that to, to compete in today's marketplace, you need to have something that you're the best at. So in your experience working with AEC firms, architecture firms in particular, what are, how does a firm go about becoming the best at something? I think, first of all, you truly have to understand the meaning of the word unique. 
Everybody writes proposals, and we all say we're uniquely qualified to do whatever the type of work is. And then we present a list of all the reasons why we're unique. And the chances are that if 20 firms all, uh, uh, went after that same project, at least 15 of them will have had most of the items on their unique list that's on your unique list. Okay, So you really have to stop and think, what do I do that nobody else in the country does or nobody else on planet Earth does? Or what do I do that's better than or why, do, why is my process more effective than? But you have to be brutally honest with yourself and be able to answer that question. And if there is not anything you do that is any better than anyone else right now, then you may have to look for that. You may have to set your sights on what skill can I learn. Um, but the fact is that I think that the first step is that we all talk about uniqueness, and but we don't have good reasons why we're unique. I think if you have that, then you bring a lot to the table. If you understand why you're unique, then you understand what you bring to the table. And, and face it, most small firms, unless they're looking to design a house for a family, most small firms are going to get on someone else's team. And the, and the prime is always going to want to know before they even read your stuff, what do you bring to the table? Why do I need to read your stuff as opposed to the guy I always use? You know, yeah. so you really have to be brutally honest with yourself about what are my what are the company's skills? What's the good side? What's the downside? Because you're going to have to be able to write stuff that that downplays the downside too. Do you have an example of a firm that you've worked with to craft this sort of, or a firm that's done this, that's honed in on their on their uniqueness and been able to to sell yes. that? Yes. The, in fact, it's the it's the firm whose uh, whose chairman originally recommended that I read Good to Great, and that is a Texas firm called Freeze and Nichols. Um, they are about a 500 person firm now in a dozen offices. All of their offices are in Texas, and until recently, almost all of their project work that I knew of was in Texas. They were my best client for six years, and in that time. I wrote maybe seven or eight proposals a year for them, and I only wrote one proposal for a piece of work outside Texas in that entire time. But in terms of Texas firms, they are well-known, well-respected, and their big, uh, what Jim Collins calls their hedgehog concept, is that they can be better at client service than anybody else. And indeed, that's one of the one of the places where their reputation is they are known for good technical work as well and good management work but the place where they truly excel um, that most other firms uh, wish they did as well was client service and that was the decision that they made because they knew that technically they could never best the the twenty thousand forty thousand sixty thousand person firms um, but good reference letters that you can put in your website and put in your proposals and great quotes that you can use come from great client service. And that's what they decided to uh, to make their brand was their client service. They wound up winning a Malcolm Baldridge Award as one of the few consulting firms that's done that. And I think they were the first engineering firm ever to win a Baldridge. Interesting. Well, give me an example of how they – what makes their customer service better than others? Because I know a lot of every every firm says that their customer service is the best or their client service. Well, the fact is that we all say that we're client focused or client oriented or whatever, but they they live it. They really do. They um, if somebody runs across an article that they think a client might be interested in, they will copy the article and send it to them or scan it and send it to them or send them a link. If a client, when, when they're visiting, says, gee, I wish I had a such and such, if they know where to get it, they will find it for them or let them know where it is. They don't worry about, am I getting paid for this 45 minutes or not? It's all part of the client interaction. Um, they also run a Friesen Nichols University, and they make their classes open to their clients as well, and there's no charge on that. It's just, you know, just let them know you're going to be there and then show up for the class. But they really understand the concept of, you know, my, one of the, uh, there's an early story about FedEx that somebody sent a package, the weather was bad, the truck broke down, and the guy rented a van and drove Wherever it was to deliver that package within the right frame time frame, it cost them a couple of thousand dollars to do it, 
and his supervisor was like was ready to, to kill him until the vice president said, no, this is exactly what we need people to be doing is to have that kind of care that when we say we get your package there, we get your package there. They have the same kind of commitment of whatever it takes. If we, you know, if we're not getting paid for that hour, so be it. Whatever it takes to make this client not only happy, but successful. And, and I think that's what it's about. I think in most cases, firms just want to keep the client happy so there's no complaint and maybe they'll come back for the next project. But Friesen Nichols is committed to the success of each of its clients as well and, and demonstrates that every day in their work, in their work attitudes and, and, and in their activities. Excellent. Give me some examples of, now let's move on to the statement of qualifications that you work and help people craft. Mm -hmm. What makes a successful response? <laughs> oh, gosh. I always tell people, just as a starting point, an architect is perfectly happy with a document that's 50 pages of pictures and not a single word of text. True. An engineer is perfectly happy with 50 pages of text and not a single image. And if you have an AE proposal or an AE statement of qualifications, the problem is finding some balance that's going to make them both happy. Um, I think that it is absolutely possible to over-design a document to the point where all they can see is your graphics and they never get your message. So I think that what makes this what makes a successful SOQ is that number one, you have a compelling story. Okay, everything is a storytelling event. If you don't have a compelling story, great graphics will probably get them to read. Okay, what do you mean by story? Can you give me an example okay. of a compelling story? Well, why did you form your company? Was it just because you no longer liked for working for someone else or because you wanted to bring services to a certain kind of firm or to a certain niche in the marketplace? So why you why you put why you founded your company is part of your story. Why your company is organized the way it is is part of the story and the client has to feel like it's organized in such a way as to make things more successful for the client as opposed to to make bookkeeping easier or you know something like that. Uh, they also, you also have to be able to talk about how and why your staff is your best resource, because every company says their staff is our most important resource, but they don't necessarily live it, you know. And then they, or, or they, they say the staff is our most important resource, and they allocate a hundred dollars per person per year to training, as opposed to five thousand dollars per person per year for training, or something like that. So I think that that number one, you have to have a good story. Number two, you have to have graphics that move the story along, and there's a, a guy named Matt Handel who has a great website called Helping Everyone, Everybody, Every Day. And it's for the AEC industry, and, and people like me or like Matt write things that are helpful for them there. And one of the things Matt says is that the purpose of pictures in an SOQ or a proposal is to make the person want to read the text that tells them what the picture's about. Okay? So if you have good pictures, it can make somebody read the story even if you didn't have the most compelling telling of that story. So bottom line is you want to have a good story and you want to have graphics that get you where you need to go but that do not muddy up the storyline. I have seen a proposal for a firm that should have won the job that didn't even get shortlisted, but it had graphics in the header, graphics in the footer, a watermark on every page of the document, plus two or three extra graphics scattered on every page, and the client couldn't find the meat of the document. There was just too many graphics getting in the way of it. So I think you have to remember that uh, when you got your first box of 64 Crayola, and for the first two weeks you thought you had to use every color in every picture, that we have a great many tools available to us through things like Word and InDesign and, and, and Photoshop and all of this, but you can't use every tool on every page of the document or all they see is your graphic work and they don't get your message. And the message is, has got to be more important than the pictures. Okay. So make, you're saying make your message clear, have a story. Now, are, are there common mistakes that you see firms making with their proposals? Yes. Well, with propose well, with proposals or with SOQs. Explain to me the difference for those okay. out there who may be wondering. 
you meet somebody at a trade show and he says, gee, I didn't know you did transportation work. So you send him something that discusses your qualifications for transportation work. You have no idea if he has a project at this point, much less what it is. All right. So you can give him project descriptions of transportation work. You can briefly describe your staff. You may want to make a table and talk about your transportation leaders, but you don't have resumes yet. And you might not necessarily know whether he's talking about a city street, a state highway, a federal interstate, an airport pavement, a light rail pro uh, uh, project, or a seaport. All you know is he's talking transportation. But when a proposal comes, and so the ch chances are there's not going to be a project approach because there's no project defined. Sometimes you'll see an, an NSOQ requested when, when the project is an IDIQ, an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, which means you're going to do different things over a certain time period, but we can't tell you what they are now. Sometimes the first project is identified, but there could be 30 projects, one hopes, or more over the length of the IDIQ. So you might be able to give them an approach to doing that first project. But if there's no project described, the only approach you can give them is your approach to working under an IDIQ contract. So, um, so at that point, so that you got an SOQ. But once they tell you this is the project, here's the scope of the project, and we need to see, in addition to some project experience and resumes, we need to see your understanding of the project. We need to see your project approach. We need to see possibly a detailed work plan. Uh, we may need to see a schedule. And we may need to see a budget if it's the type of work for which they're allowed by law to ask for a cost pro a cost proposal before they actually select the firm. If it's public sector, they have to select you based on your qualifications before they can ask anyone for price information, because most of the time when somebody lowballs something, we've had too many buildings collapse and bridges collapse, and and uh, I know of a building in, in one city where the architect, uh, the, the structural engineer on the project made a mistake and designed the, the entire 16 or 18 story building for the dead loads. In other words, the building supports its own weight, but you couldn't put a desk in it because it, it, it wouldn't support the live loads <laughs> due to a miscalculation. And they ultimately left the shell of the building standing, destroyed every floor in it, and redid the whole inside, including rebuilding every floor so it would take the, the, the live weights. So, um, the, the proposal is generally more technical, and then hopefully if, you, if you've if you got good stuff in your proposal, then you get invited to a shortlist interview. But the proposal has much more technical information. It needs technical people to write it. Generally, an SOQ can be written between a marketing person and the principal in charge of that particular kind of effort, uh, whether it's a particular studio in an architectural firm or whether it's the principal who's in charge of education projects or whatever type of project it is, all it takes is those two people because there's no technical section. When you get to a proposal, it's going to require the help of the technical people because generally the marketer does not write a project approach or a, or, or a detailed work plan. Um, they may also want to see quality assurance and quality control plans, and they're going to they're going to want information at that point on how good your cost estimating skills are and 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 how if your projects are going over uh, or if there are change orders in it, how how extensive they are and things like that, that won't be asked for generally in an SOQ. Okay. One thing you mentioned is the that generally public entities are not allowed by law to um, request fees on the first go around from firms. But that's something right. that, quite honestly, I see it happen a lot here in my own area. I don't know whether you were here. I, I see cities all the time doing that. Um, on the state level, I can't say that I have seen that but the smaller municipalities. Is that something that you're seeing? It depends on the type of work, okay? The Brooks Act, which is the federal law that, that all of these come from, prohibits, uh, or the, the Brooks Act specifies qualifications-based selection for professional services, including architecture and engineering. Um, in some states, the state version of the Brooks Act, and, there, and 49 out of 50 states have a state version of the Brooks Act. The 50th state um, has the provisions of the Brooks Act in its regulations and requirements, but it doesn't actually have a law. 
Okay, so basically every every state's following it, and the way the state laws are written, they must go, they must trickle down to the cities and counties as well. But if it's an environmental project, they can ask for fees. If it's a planning project, a survey project, a construction management contract that has no field engineering in it, those kinds of things, they can ask for fees. In certain states. They have defined some of those additional services as professional. So um, I think I think in Texas you cannot ask for fees up front on surveying, but you can on environmental or landscape architecture um, because it's not considered the same way. I th I believe, um, but but and some states are different on what they recognize as a professional service or not. But architecture and engineering in the Brooks Act at the federal level, if they ask for it up front, they're doing something illegal. Some will try to get around it by asking you for an estimate of how much time it's going to take. But the assumption is that if we make all firms the same hourly rates, the firm that's going to take the most time is going to cost the most. Consequently, they've gotten cost information without asking for it. They're not allowed to do that either. Um, and at the state level and the, and the city level, they're, they're not supposed to. And, and if they do, all the architect or engineer is supposed to do is point out to the owner that they're not supposed to do that and refuse to submit a bid. Mm -hmm. And that may mean bypassing the project if the owner won't change the RFP. But groups like AIA or ASCE can actually censure the architect or engineering firm for submitting on that kind of thing because it was illegal to ask and equally illegal to, to respond. Well, that's very interesting, and I, I didn't realize, well, I mean, I guess I sort of did realize the laws about it, but it's interesting to know about the um, some of the resources that architects can take when they see this happening. Yeah, I, I actually have a, a client for whom I wrote a proposal uh, about two months ago for a transit agency, so it's kind of quasi-public. Um, they got shortlisted, and apparently all three firms were asked for a rate schedule, not for in because there was no project defined in it. It was an IDIQ on call type of project, so they were just asked for hourly rates for different levels of people. Um, and the only reason they could get away with it was that it was mostly a planning effort, and and was going to involve potentially on some of the contracts. Uh, some preliminary, like first 10% of the engineering, conceptual engine design. And so they were able to get away with it because most of the product they were looking for was not uh, design related. Interesting. So let's, it, let's, it, let's it's, a, it's a gray area. Okay. Let's tackle the SOQs then. What are some common mistakes? Give me one or two common mistakes that you see firms making when they do an SOQ. I think that. Number one, a lot of it's very difficult to write an SOQ to present your qualifications and still have the document read like it's about the client. Okay? Any document that just screams me, me, me is not something the client wants to read. It's not that they don't want to know what you can do, but what they want to know really is what can you do for them and, and how will it help them. So instead of saying, we can design your building, what you might want to be looking at is, if you need more space, we can help you figure out whether you need an addition or a new building and how to plan it and blah, blah, blah. And that way you can talk about your skills, but you can talk about your skills in the context of helping them. But a, a recitation of all the things you can do and all the vehicles you own and all of the equipment you own and all the projects you've ever done is not going to cut it. Uh, and it also has to stay relatively brief. I, I knew of a firm that uh, years ago they got their first Oracle database, and it was virtually infinitely expandable. And so they had all of these resumes and all of these projects in the database, and their attitude suddenly became never give a man 10 pages when you can give him 110 pages. And so they might take a look at a transportation resume and say, okay, this could be highways, in which case we need a pavement guy and a drainage guy, but it could also be mass transit. So in that, we might also need mechanical and electrical and an architect for the stations. And then it could also be a seaport, so we might need maritime work and this, that, and the other. By the time they were done, there were 40 resumes in it, and they still didn't know what the project was. So you have to be careful about how you load it down. My SOQ, I believe, including front and back cover, is 14 pages. Okay. Okay, um, so you just you, and 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 you and you also have to 
you have to construct your SOQ files in such a way that, let's say, you, you instead of one big section that talks about your ability with K-12 and um, higher education and hospitals and hospitalities, you might want separate sections on those. And so if a guy calls you and says, well, what do you do with hospitals? You don't have to put any of the other stuff in there. So he gets 15 pages about hospitals instead of 90 pages about every different kind of building you can work on. And so you want that SOQ to be as flexible as possible. You also want to know that nothing should ever read like it's boilerplate. Everything has to be tailored, even if it is boilerplate, especially if it's boilerplate. It has to be tailored to that client who made the request for your qualifications so that they feel like you are responding to them and not just giving them some standard document off the shelf that took you no thought. Okay. Great advice. Bernie, do you have a success quote that you'd like to share with us today? You know... <laughs> Many years ago, when I worked uh, in, in New York City for a commodity ex futures exchange, the president of the exchange had a quote on his wall, and I, I still remember it, but it was, never, it, was, it was not attributed. I have no idea where it came from. But it just kind of makes a lot of sense to me. And, the, and, the, and the, the quote is, stronger than all the establishments of man is an idea whose time has come. which basically says to me, if it's the right time to do it, nothing is going to get in its way, or nothing should get in its way. And how would you say architects could apply this to their, their businesses? Well, I think that people are, um, professionals have the skills to make a number of different kinds of judgments. And one of those judgments is that they, they, they can look at an idea they have and know whether it's really good, really original, or, 20, or, they, or they've had this idea because they've seen 20 other people do it. And I think that a lot of it's about having confidence uh, in your own decision-making capability. But sometimes you look at something and you say, you know what, this may work when the economy picks up, but right now it's going to offend a lot of people. Or this is really great now, but once the economy picks up, we'll be like left in the dust if we don't do this. So I think that you have to have the courage of your convictions to be able to make a judgment and then stick with it. You know, um, maybe it is the right time to open a new firm now that things are turning around. But three years ago, four years ago, you had to have a lot of courage to open your own firm because we didn't really know when the end was in sight. And now, at least, even for people who haven't experienced much of an upturn, they can at least see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And so, you know, so you, you have to be able to just use your best judgment and, and be confident in the decisions you make, but have enough of a cushion um, that if you have to, if you have to just abort and say, you know what, this was a bad choice right now, that you can get out of that and, and go do something else and that there's, that no one's going to think any less of you. In fact, we might think more of you for having the sense to get out instead of staying in and wiping out your life savings to do it. So um, I think that, that um, if the idea is right and you and you have ex exercised your best judgment, then you don't let anybody stand in the way of you and your goals. Awesome. I think that's a great place to end this interview right. uh, for this week, and I really appreciate it, Bernie. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you much. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there and I will send you instant access to free resources including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world.
the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.